Hi, and welcome to our recording of the Wise Wisconsin Winter Series. Our topic today is social connection. I am Sarah Ritchie, the Lifespan Program Manager with UW-Madison Division of Extension. Your facilitator for today's session will be Heather, and I'll just hand it over to Heather to introduce herself. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you for joining us and watching this tape or video, whatever we're calling it these days. My name is Heather Quackenboss, and I am from La Crosse County as the Human Development and Relationships Educator. I'm really happy to talk to you about social connection because social connection can be tough in a good year. And this year with COVID and all of the different ways we are trying to connect, it looks a little different and that's okay. So we're going to go through what we can do in, with connection in general and maybe talk a little bit about what we can do with connection in a pandemic. So when we look at connection, we honestly need to know ourselves first because we can't connect with anyone else unless we're connecting with ourselves and knowing what we like and prefer. And then we need to create those connections. What do we do? How do we meet people? How do we meet people we like? And then how to keep those connections because honestly, sometimes that maintenance takes a lot of work. Now, the pictures that you see are pre-pandemic, pre and one of the goals that I had for myself one year was to have coffee or a beverage with 52 different people. It was my 52 cups goal. Now, that sounds kind of easy. It sounds like, okay, once a week you go together with a friend or a family or somebody, and you have a cup of coffee. Honestly, folks, didn't work that way. I front-loaded it in January because I had a feeling that some months or weeks might not be okay, might be tougher to, to get things done. And in all honesty, at the end of the year, I probably only had 48 to 50 of those. So did I completely fulfill my goal? No. And I also did have coffee and connect with a lot of folks. So it was really beneficial. So we can have goals, we can do things, we can figure out what works for us and give ourselves that grace for when it doesn't exactly work out. So how do we connect? Honestly, we do need to know our style and what we prefer. So these next two pictures, on the left, two people, really a lot of words there, a lot of interaction, a lot of maybe deeper thoughts, some of us, prefer that picture. We're a little bit more one-on-one. -on -one. Maybe we're a little bit more introverted. We find our energy by being by ourselves or being with just one or two other people and we really dive into different conversations and dialogues. For some of you, that picture makes you a little bit ugh, itchy. And you look at the picture on the right and say, yeah, groups of people, you know, getting together and just, you know, maybe a party setting, maybe a group setting and just really getting that energy from those groups of people. And maybe you're more extroverted and maybe you really like getting all kinds of ideas from all kinds of people. Both of these are absolutely amazing. And most of us lean one way or the other, where we get our energy from, what we prefer. And I will say that for folks who are extroverts in those group people, this pandemic has been harder because you are not getting together with folks. And frankly, Zoom is not the best alternative to fulfill that need. It's nice and it doesn't necessarily fill our buckets. So knowing if you're introverted or extroverted, knowing if you like one person or a whole lot of people really does help us when we're looking at how we connect. That next thing really is starting to look at our core value too. Sometimes when we connect with people, it's with that core value with what a person is and who they are. So I'm going to ask you to look at this list and it's not an all-inclusive list. This is a fairly small list of values. And for all of us, I'm going to ask you to pick one. One value that kind of sums you up, sums up who you are, what you believe, how you live. And I'm actually going to ask Sarah, Sarah, what would you pick as your core value? Maybe from this list, maybe it's a word that I don't have on here. It's really hard to just choose one. Um, so I think I'll go with family, but I was also wanting to go with friends or health, but it's just, it's difficult, but I'll stick with family. All right, so thank you, Sarah, and family. In all honesty, here's, here's what I've done. And I know this might be kind of against my, my rule, but I picked connection. 
because I, I want to be authentic and real and true. I also want to, you know, family's important, friends are important. I really, I love that harmony. So for me, connection fits those things within it. That's okay to do. I, I you know, we can, we can squish the rules sometimes. So like for that. Sarah, for you, that might be, that might be a little bit different too. Yeah, I like that rule. <laughs> Makes it a little easier. It really does. It really does. So looking at that value. It can, it can feel very nebulous, very, you know, almost in the clouds because, okay, your value is connection, Heather. What does that even mean? And here's what I'm going to ask you back. What does it look like every day to live that value? So for me, and Sarah, I'm going to ask you this in a second too. For me, that connection means, all right, I want to connect with my family when I'm with them. So sometimes I might have to really you know, just put that computer away and intentionally do that because it can be hard. It can, you can suck you right in. Sometimes it's all right, I have to put my phone across the room because I might pay more attention to that and I really don't want to. It might be that connection, listening to stories that I don't necessarily care about because I know to create connection, I wanna hear from my teenage kids and sometimes they're talking about things like, oh man, I'm not interested in this at all. And knowing that if I want to create that connection, I need to listen when it's important to them too. So Sarah, with family, what does that look like for you every day? Um, well, for me, I, it's been really difficult with um, the COVID pandemic and not being able to see some of my family. Some of my family I haven't seen in probably over a year, um, but try, trying to make phone calls with them or, or plan a time to do FaceTime. I have an almost three-year-old, so when I'm home, sometimes that means dropping everything um, when he's saying, mommy, mommy, come play with me, and just really focusing on living in that moment and playing cards with him or playing in his kinetic sand or just make-believe. So just really focusing on what I have and the positives of of what is happening now and in the moment and trying not to focus on the fact that I can't hug some of my family right now because that is really difficult, so. Yeah, and there's so many different things that go on. So knowing what it looks like for you is really important. And if you wanna just stop here and think about it for a while, feel free to hit pause and let that swirl in your head because sometimes it is one of those questions you're like, oh, I have no idea because we don't necessarily think this way. We often think of what do I need to do next? So slowing down and thinking about that value for us helps us connect to what's important to us. And it also helps us figure out, okay, what do you say yes to then? If your value is connection, do I say yes to putting my computer away? If your value is family, do you say yes to kinetic sand? If your value is service, do you say yes when someone asks, you know, for a volunteer? So what do you say yes to? And later, we'll talk a little bit about boundaries. When you know what you want to say yes to, it's easier to say no to those things that don't match your value or don't fit. Now, the other way we connect with folks is through activities and through shared goals, shared likes, shared loves. So are you a, an outdoors kind of person and maybe an active outdoors person. Are you somebody that's like, no, I am not going outside. It is negative stupid degrees out and there's no way I'm going out and I like to stay inside with tea and a book. Do you like playing games? Do you enjoy art or photography? Do you enjoy being more by yourself and reading? Or, you know, maybe you have grandkids or children or people in your life that you do things with and maybe right now that looks different, or maybe you still have folks who are in your bubble. Knowing what you really like sometimes brings folks together, even if their values are different. So we might connect through shared values. We might connect through shared likes. And sometimes we don't meet people who are the exact same as us. And that is okay. Because when we connect to others, we might connect in little ways or maybe some superficial ways and that's awesome or we connect on this really deep level 
And that is good too. So knowing ourselves, whether we're an introvert or an extrovert, whether we appreciate being with one person or a group, what do we value? And maybe those about those folks that we are with, maybe we kind of you know balance each other out a little bit. Or maybe we are very similar and it works well. So what works for us is important. So turning then, how do we connect with others. And honestly, here's this lovely rhinoceros. And this rhinoceros is such a beautiful painter and painting all these beautiful landscapes. And in every single picture, their horn is right there. Honestly, folks, we all have that horn. We have our education, our experience, our biases, our likes, our loves, our dislikes. We all have different perspectives. When it gets us into trouble is when we think we have the only perspective and everyone else has the same perspective. This is where a lot of conflict happens, right? So knowing that here's my perspective and from what I know, and this person maybe has a very different perspective, that's really important. Now, when we're trying to look at different perspectives or learn different perspectives or meet new people or try new things, we go right into our growth zone circles. Now, these circles, all of us are over here by that donkey. We are in our comfort zones, right? We feel safe and in control. Right now, we might be in front of our computer, maybe covered with a blanket, drinking our favorite hot beverage. It's our comfort zone and it's beautiful. Whenever we try something new or do something different, we tend not to be very good at it at first. And one of those sayings is be brave enough to stink at something new. And every time we try to stink at something new, we go right into that fear zone. And in that fear zone, we don't have the confidence. We find excuses to say, oh, this isn't gonna work or I can't do this. And we are very affected by other people's opinions. And sometimes, maybe more often than others, we get to that fear zone and we say, nope, we go right back to our comfort zone. And that's fair, we can choose that. And if we do want to learn something new, and if we want to get to that learning zone where we can deal with challenges and problems and we can acquire new skills and in fact extend our comfort zone whenever we learn something new or try something new, we actually do make our comfort zone bigger. And when we do that, that fear zone gets a little smaller. So if we get through that fear zone and get to that learning zone, we're doing different things. We're, we're having, you know, maybe some more fun. We're dealing with those things that come up. Now, the unicorn is there in that growth zone because honestly, that growth zone is a little bit rare, just like rainbow unicorns. And this is where we're living our dreams and finding our purpose and setting new goals. So just a, an easy, simple, almost silly example for this. I kind of play piano. And every year, my kids are in solo ensemble. And I try to accompany them because it's something we can do together. We connect, right? So I get that piano song and I'm in my comfort zone with what I can play and I get whatever song they have. And folks, some of those accompaniments are terrible. And so I go right into that fear zone and I look at the music and I say, I can't do this. There's 37 notes played at one time and I only have 10 fingers. And frankly, I can only use five of those at the same time on a piano. And I get into that fear zone. And then I say, and I really want to connect with my kids. I really love doing this with them. I'm not being judged. I need to make them sound good. So I start playing that song and it sounds awful. And it sounds awful for a long time until I start figuring out, dealing with those challenges and problems. What can I play? What notes can I just get rid of? Can I skip these measures because there's just like 37 measures of rest? Do they really need 37 measures of rest and hear a piano solo? I work through that. Now, in all honesty, do I ever in that piano situation get to the growth zone? I'm going to totally admit no, I do not. I am still nervous and I still make mistakes. And when we play for a judge, I still am not completely comfortable with it. And I help my kids sound good and we had a really good experience together. So when you're looking at this and trying to get out of that comfort zone, it's not going to feel comfortable. 
It's going to be scary. You're going to be nervous. You might feel like, nope, I'm going back. And if you need to, that's okay. If it's not the time, it's okay. And what does it take for you to step through that fear zone? So again, one of those questions where you're like, oh, well, maybe there's something here. Maybe I need to think about this. And again, if you need to pause and think, that's okay. You can choose whatever you want to do with the video, right? So, and then I'll find my cursor. There we go. The next thing that we need to do to connect with others is have a little vulnerability. What we tend to do as humans is hide our flaws, is to not show where we might have bites like this apple taken out of it or bruises or maybe blemishes. And that, that vulnerability, we don't want to broadcast that. So we put maybe on social media, maybe when we're talking to people, we make our lives look really shiny and happy like the apple in the mirror. And that's okay. And sometimes we need a person to talk to. Sometimes our vulnerabilities are those things where people can say, wow, you know, Heather, you're nervous about this and you're really good at this. So sometimes folks can help us talk through some of those. So it's one of those, do you have a person? Do you have a person you can be authentic and raw and completely real with? And can you do that with yourself? Because that can be really hard. And I'm not talking about that inner critic because we have probably are our own worst critic. We, you know, make a mistake, we're like, I messed that up, that's done, I'm never doing that again. And so that vulnerability with ourself is important too. So how do you work with that? How do you start being vulnerable? How do we maybe get okay with it ourselves? I'm, I'm gonna talk about the F word, folks, feelings. And I know sometimes in the Midwest, we have a stereotype of being very stoic, and everything's fine and everything's good. And honestly, if we acknowledge our own feelings, we can start working on some of that vulnerability or some of those things that maybe have hindered us or have kept us from moving through that fear zone. So if we're happy, we can say that. If we're sad, it's all right to say that. If we're angry, that feeling can be a little bit scary and it's just anger. A lot of times our feelings, you know, anger is, okay, what's, what's wrong? What do you feel you need to fight for? You know, what's going on? Something's not right in your life if we're angry. If we're sad and we're grieving, you know, what, what are we missing? What's, what's not here that's not filling me? So acknowledging those feelings is going to be important. Now, two small stories with this. There was one day, I, well, back when, we did all the, the things that were used to be normal and we don't know if they will be again. I dropped my kids off at school. And it was one of those days where everything in the morning was just going wrong. And everyone needed something and no one was fulfilling anyone's needs. And my daughter got out of the car and slammed the door and I was like, I love you. And she just stormed off. And I started crying middle of the middle school drop-off line, here's this mom in her car just sobbing. And so I tried to drive away, and as I was driving away, I thought, oh my gosh, I'm overwhelmed. And as soon as I said it, folks, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm overwhelmed. Now I can deal with this. It also, it worked the other way. I was picking the same kiddo up from school some other time, and I knew she had had an awful, terrible day. She had received some news that was a little bit crushing. So I knew this going into it. And when I picked her up, it did. I mean, it looked like the world was on her shoulders. And I just looked at her and I said, you are so sad, aren't you? And she started crying. And frankly, I then immediately drove to the restaurant that serves chili cheese fries. And we just had chili cheese fries and sat in that sadness. So maybe that wasn't the best example and I showed my daughter how to eat emotionally and we also sat in that sadness for a while. So acknowledging it and just being with it sometimes is really important and honestly okay to do. The other thing that those feelings help us lead to is empathy. And if we really want to connect with someone to feel what they're feeling, to know and understand what they are going through. Now, sometimes we say, oh, I have empathy. 
You know, I take a casserole when if, if somebody passes away or I, you know, say, oh, I'm sorry if someone, you know, didn't get the job they wanted. Well, a lot of times what we do is we do a lot of sympathy. And sympathy drives some disconnection where empathy gets that connection. So I'm going to stop the share right here and share something new. So you see our faces for a second here. And I'm going to get the right thing. And we're going to watch a very short video. And this is Brene Brown. And it's her talk on empathy. So here we go. <sighs> So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's a, it, very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, and climb down. I know what it's like down here and you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, no, you want a sandwich? <laughs> um, empathy is a choice and it's a vulnerable choice because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time. Because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. Thank you, Sarah, for your help with that video. And sometimes we, uh, we connect to try to, to work things out. So looking at that, that empathy, that taking another person's perspective, feeling that feeling that they probably are having really does help us connect. Often we try to be that solver, that fixer, that helper, and sometimes the best thing for our social connection is to just be there. And when we're doing that, we also need to have a little harmony in there. Now notice I did not use the word balance because when we use that word balance, we think both things need to be equal or we think, oh, you're way over here and I'm way over here. We have to find the exact middle ground. And sometimes that does not work. We're seeing that in our society right now where things are very divisive and we're trying to maybe find a middle ground and folks aren't, aren't ready to maybe move or collaborate or cooperate. So harmony, again, I play the piano here, harmony can be all kinds of different chords. Now we like the one, three, five chord, right? It sounds much, much nicer than a seventh or a second. You know, those dissonant chords can be a little bit hard. And in fact, one of the songs that I was talking talking about yesterday was actually on the radio today and I forced myself to listen to it but it was a very dissonant song that I needed to play in high school and I hated the song and I 
well, I did not do well on the song in the, in the piano contest. And I also needed to learn how to appreciate that harmony. Those dissonant harmonies sometimes are our lives for maybe longer times than we want. This pandemic is certainly a dissonant harmony that isn't all that pretty. And it is what we have right now. So to know, okay, where, what am I willing to do? What do I need to work on? How do I need to work toward my own growth so I can connect with others authentically and not try to make them fill what I might be missing? And how much am I willing to lean in? So we have one sunflower emerging here and okay, what am I ready to do? And the other sunflower leaning towards the sun. And from what I learned about sunflowers this year, and I have not researched this folks, this was only found on Facebook, so dangerous to do. One of the memes on Facebook was when sunflowers don't lean towards the sun, when the sun's not out, they lean towards each other. And I thought that was really pretty. And if it's totally fake, I still love the thought of it. So do we lean in toward that sun, our values, or maybe toward each other, maybe like sunflowers do or do not do? And this is also then having those healthy boundaries. So looking back at that value and saying, all right, what am I saying yes to? And what am I willing to do? And what do I say no to? Or sometimes it's, am I ready to do this? Am I ready to connect this way? It's important to know. So connecting to ourselves then, how do we do that so we can connect to other people authentically? Oh, we have to accept ourselves as we are, our faults, our good things, our successes, all of that. Here we have two ice cream bars and the poor cookies saying, oh, those guys are so much cooler than me. Well, honestly, right now in the middle of winter, I'm not really thinking of an ice cream. I'm thinking of the cookie. So sometimes we need to really be aware of what is it that I'm good at? Where am I most beneficial? Where do I shine? And to accept that and to know, okay, on a hot summer day, maybe I'm not, you know, the first thing that a person thinks of, but man, I'm a good cookie. So knowing that you can accept who you are is, is really important. Another thing that we are learning so much about is stress. And this work comes from Kelly McGonigal, who says stress, we need to make it our friend. A lot of times we look at stress as this enemy that we need to avoid it at all costs. And what she's found through her research is it's not the stress that is harmful to us. It is our reaction and our thought about stress. So if we think stress is bad, it's gonna be bad for us. If we think of stress as a challenge or this is helping me do something, we're going to have a much different attitude. And she actually really looked at mortality and health when it came to stress. So how do you reframe the stresses in your life? So let's go back to that music example. When I play music, my hands get a little sweaty. I know I'm breathing harder, my heart's pounding, my eyes maybe dilate, all of those stress responses our body does. Well, here's the thing, you know what? My eyes are dilated, I can see my music better now, right? and my hands are a little bit sweaty, that means blood's flowing to them, so I'm ready to make them move. And my heart rate is racing, I know I can take a deep breath, and I know I'm gonna be a little bit focused. So using it as it benefits you is, is, is a learning process. I'm not gonna say it's easy, and we can reframe that. And this, this is one of my kiddos, he did allow me to use this picture, it is okay to be uncomfortable. I think for a lot of us, we are afraid to get uncomfortable and then we don't work through that fear zone. And this, this was after a bike race. It was miserable, it was raining and half snowing and it was cold and everything was looked like a lake instead of a field in the woods. And it was, it was awful. And sometimes we get through those things and it's not comfortable. And I'm just going to tell you, it's okay if it's not. Conflict, is not comfortable. And when that's not comfortable, we know there's things we can work on and do and change. And on the other side of it, it's going to look different. So when we, when we think about that then, and think about how that learning and those relationships and that conflict's uncomfortable, 
we can look at that feeling again, how we acknowledge our feelings. We are like, okay, I'm scared here. I'm not comfortable. I'm scared. I'm afraid. Feelings, particularly if you're like, Heather, I don't know about these feelings things. What are you talking about? Feelings are data points for what we need. And we all have these universal needs. So when we're afraid, what do we need? Do we need some nurturance or protection? Do we need some predictability or security? Do we need to feel we belong or that we matter or that we're heard? Or do we need some different support? Knowing, okay, here's my feeling. I've just named it. Now I can figure out what is it that I need for that. And that is one of those first steps to really becoming empathetic with ourself and then with other people. So the other thing we can kind of do is we can stop apologizing for our faults and we can start thanking folks. Just a little flip of how we say things. So instead of, I'm sorry I'm late, thank you for waiting for me. I'm sorry I messed up. Thanks for being patient with me. Oh, I'm sorry I'm talking way too much. Thank you for listening to me. Just that slight reframe with words, the thank you instead of I'm sorry, can really, really help us know that, hey, I am worth it, I can do this, and I'm really making a connection with this person, and they're also doing the same for me. And then connecting authentically. We all have those superficial relationships, right? We go to the grocery store and maybe we talk to the cashier because honestly, after 11 months, we're really, really thankful to talk to someone that was not in our household or just talk to a person if we're living by ourselves. Maybe it's the person who puts the groceries in your trunk if you're picking up the groceries from the store and you're like, how are you? And that's a really nice thing to have. Having those small tidbits of connection are important too. And to really make sure that we connect authentically, we can also do a few different things. So what we have often is most of us in this world, we see things, we observe it, we interpret it immediately. And then we have judgment about it immediately. It doesn't even cross our mind to stop and think about it. When we interpret things and judge things right away, we don't have any connection. We get to right to just fixing it and demanding a fix and a solution. So let, let's just take driving, for example. If I'm driving along and somebody flies by me, I immediately interpret that that person must be just a little bit nuts and dangerous. If they're driving that fast. They have absolutely no right to be on the road. We shouldn't do that. And I'm thinking they should slow down and there should be a police officer and pull them over for speeding. I'm not connecting with that person. So we can turn to what's called nonviolent communication. And this is where those feelings and needs come up. So maybe we observe. All right, this person just flew by me. And what's my feeling about that? God, I'm a little nervous. You know, I'm a little nervous to be on the road with, with me in the car or my people in the car. And, and maybe I'm, I'm kind of scared. What's my need here? I need to not drive next to this person. And then what's that request? What might I need to do? Maybe I need to figure out how to back off because I'm probably not going to follow the person to a parking lot and, and say, hey, you made me feel a little scared. I'm not gonna do that, nobody really does that. What happens here is we can observe this and we know our feeling. Here's where we can practice that empathy. Wow, that person must really be in a hurry, just like I am sometimes. If we can look at a little part of what's going on, what we observe, and see where we are sometimes that way too, that's gonna help lead us to some of that empathy. And then those feelings and needs that we have, we can look at, okay, here's my feeling about this. I'm maybe a little nervous. What's their feeling? Maybe they're late for work and maybe their car is not okay and they're late for work and they're getting in trouble. Or maybe, maybe somebody in the car is having a baby and they need to get to the hospital. You know, thinking of what are those feelings like they may be having. Because when you look at, here's my feelings, here's maybe what their feelings would be, then we can look at those needs. Here's my need in this situation. Here's their need in this situation. And we can do that with all kinds of conflicts. Hey, I'm feeling a little bit irritated that you didn't unload the dishwasher. You know, I do all of these things. 
I need, honestly, maybe some dependability and help with the dishwasher because that's honestly what our conflicts look like. Right now in a pandemic, we're looking across the room if we live with people and we are in the house with those same people for 11 months and we're like, I can't believe you're breathing so hard. Or, oh my gosh, how are you chewing? Or are you listening to the television that loudly again? And so we start getting irritated because we're so close all the time. And we get some of those feelings. And sometimes it's different day to day. We have different needs than day to day. So maybe, hey, I love you and that television's really loud. Can you please turn it down? I, I need a little bit of quiet. So we can do that and when we look at it with feelings and needs, it can be a little bit easier. So taking from today, when I feel whatever feeling you have, what is it that you generally need? That is a really nice practice to start working on that empathy because we need it for ourselves first. And then when you feel whatever way, and you get to you get to observe what you think that is you need this and then we can ask for that solution so when when maybe my daughter is asking me all kinds of questions and rapid fire like like teenagers can do and some of us have folks in our lives where blah, 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 we can say oh i'm a little overwhelmed i i need you to slow down i want to connect with you and i i need a break and you are maybe feeling a little anxious and you need to talk to folks. And so you need some belonging. Let's figure out how we can do this so both of us can connect. The, the other easy, this is, sound, this is gonna sound silly too, a little bit easy and a little bit hard is let's replace but with and. We are a people who love the word but. I love you, but I want you to replace the toilet paper roll. I love you and you need to get your schoolwork done. Well, I just used and because I'm practicing that. So when we say, look at that, when we say but, a lot of the things that are said before the but aren't remembered. I love you, but, okay, do you really? Because now you're kind of just giving me a demand. You know, I love you and I would like you to replace the toilet paper. It's a lot different. I'm proud of you and you need to get your homework done, makes me almost feel like I'm in a supportive role and I will help you if you need it, rather than if I say, but, then you're on your own, figure it out. So challenge for you today or in the future to replace your but. I mean like stop the sentence and start it over again if you say the word but and put and in there instead. It actually makes a huge difference when you're connecting with folks. And then going back to that growth and how to get to those learning zones. Getting through those fear zones will expand our comfort zone and help us connect with someone else, even if that vulnerability feels so scary. And that is really how we can connect a little bit better and a little bit, you know, maybe with ourselves and those other folks. And during this pandemic, it is very different. And I want to acknowledge that some folks have been in their house for the last 11 months and very, very closed off from a lot of pe people. And some folks make decisions to do something that maybe you know, is risky and other folks judge it. I know we're all judged in different ways and that's really hard. And to be that judged makes it hard to connect. So finding your people, finding what you are willing to do and what others are willing to do. If you can work that out, that's beautiful. And if somebody says, well, nope, this is what I'm gonna do. And you're like, well, this is what I'm going to do. Sometimes that connection isn't right for right now. And that is okay too, as hard as that may be. So we wanna thank you for this. And you can maybe even email us and what's still circling in your mind from today. And thank you so much for attending and watching the video. And we look forward to seeing you for other series.